Well, if you would, turn with me to 1 Timothy chapter 6. 1 Timothy chapter 6. Uh, tonight, uh, as uh, you've likely uh, drawn already from uh, what I said a moment ago, uh, we'll be studying Christian contentment in the Scripture, going on with uh, the uh, suggestions that were put uh, into the suggestion box. Uh, we're looking at Christian contentment, and likely for a few weeks to come, we'll be uh, looking at that. Uh, and just a, a little uh, anecdote, uh, something that happened earlier today, just before everyone got here, uh, as we were preparing to, to figure out the songs for tonight, uh, we asked Bethany what song uh, she wanted to sing, uh, and she wanted to uh, to uh, sing the first song that we uh, sang together, uh, It Is Well With My Soul. Uh, and I thought that was right on point that Bethany uh, picked out the song for tonight. And so tonight, looking at Christian contentment, I'd like to begin uh, by reading a, a short uh, excerpt from uh, a uh, one of the great works of, of Baptist theology, uh, John Gill's uh, Body of Practical Divinity. And he says, uh, in beginning to talk about Christian contentment, he says, contentment of mind naturally follows upon joy and peace. Where joy abounds and peace rules in the heart, contentment is. It is nowhere to be found but in go a godly man, in Christians of the first rank and class. The heathens talked much of it, but were not found in the practice of it. And indeed, few men are. Uh, an ungodly man is an utter stranger to it. The ungodly are like a troubled sea, never at rest. Contentment is a branch of true godliness, or rather a superaddition to it, which makes it greatly ornamental and profitable. For godliness with contentment is great gain. 1 Timothy 6, verse 6. And it will be proper to inquire. So by way of, of uh, introducing the topic of Christian contentment, uh, he speaks high praise of it. Uh, he says that it's it's a difficult uh, virtue to have in the Lord. It's it's hard to stay in a spirit of contentment. And he says that it, it's only truly to be found uh, in Jesus Christ, in a Christian, uh, in contentment to God through him. And so with that, I'd like to begin with that verse that he mentioned uh, there in First Timothy ver uh, chapter 6, in verse 6, but godliness with contentment is great gain. For we brought nothing into this world, and it is certain we can carry nothing out. And having food and raiment, let us be there with content. Contentment is ha resting in, having uh, sufficiency in what God has indeed given to us whatever state we find ourselves in, to be content in it. If we have food and raiment, that is enough for us. Uh, whatever God has actually given to us, or what he gives to us by prayer, uh, it is sufficient. Uh, it's not uh, the, to go out and, and look for uh, anything over and above what God has uh, given to us what he what he has indeed uh, laid in our laps uh, it is to to have what god has given to us whether that be by uh, work or by charities or by circumstances god has given to us what we have and we're to be content with it uh, and not to uh, not to to go out in a sinful way uh, and 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 thinking that um, that we need more than what god will give to us. Contentment uh, is, again, simply to rest in the circumstances that God has given to us. Uh, John Gill, a moment ago, we read, uh, rooted this virtue in peace and joy in the Lord. Uh, just as I said, it's, it's to rest in what he's given to us, uh, that, that we have brought nothing into this world ourselves, 
It is certain we can carry nothing out of it ourselves. And having food and raiment, let us be there with content what God has given to us. And so with that, I'd like us to, uh, in, in trying to understand contentment, uh, I'd like us to look at some examples in the scripture first of contented people in the Lord. I turn to James chapter 5 and verse 10 with me in trying to, to understand what contentment is. James chapter 5 and verse 10. This is uh, speaking uh, against those who uh, were discontented in the church, those who who were not sufficient in what God had given to them. Uh, In James 5, verse 10, Take, my brethren, the prophets who have spoken in the name of the Lord for an example of suffering, affliction, and of patience. And we'll notice patience goes right along with contentment. Behold, we count them happy which endure, Ye have heard of the patience of Job, and have seen the end of the Lord, that the Lord is very pitiful and of tender mercies. Uh, Job here, given as, as an example of patience, is also an example of godly contentment, of resting in what God has given to us, resting in what we have. Turn to Job chapter 1 with me. Job chapter 1, and we'll see a familiar phrase to what we read in 1 Timothy. Job chapter 1. Of course, we know that Job uh, was in a horrible circumstance. He was in afflictions. His family had been ripped away from him. All of his possessions were taken from him. And in Job chapter 1 and verse 20, we read, Then Job arose and rent his mantle and shaved his head and fell down upon the ground and worshipped and said, Naked came I out of my mother's womb, and naked shall I return thither. The Lord gave, and the Lord hath taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. In all this, Job sinned not, nor charged God with folly. Just as as Paul said in 1 Timothy, we have brought nothing into this world, and it is certain we can take nothing out of it. Job says that he came forth naked and he will return to dust naked. The Lord has given and the Lord has taken away and he blesses the name of the Lord. Uh, Even as he has next to nothing, uh, even as he only has enough to to sustain him, enough so that he can shave his head and and fall down in the ashes and, uh, and mourn over his loss, nonetheless he blesses God's name. He has contentment even in these circumstances. After his children had died, after all he had was stripped from him, he was content and he blesses God's name. He never charged God foolishly. Uh, Even after this, uh, this particular passage when his health was taken away from him, he had boils brought up on his body uh, and he was just nigh to cursing. Uh, lying in the dust, and his wife said to curse God and die. Job said that would we receive good of the Lord and not evil also? Uh, He still blesses God. He still refuses to charge God foolishly. And so Job is an example of contentment to us. And and we, we see what contentment is. Even in our difficulties, even in abject poverty as Job was, we're to be content and still bless God's name. Turn to 2 Corinthians 11.23 with me and we'll see another example of contentment. 2 Corinthians 11.23 Paul speaking here says, Are they ministers of Christ? I speak as a fool. I am more. In labors more abundant, in stripes above measure, in prisons more frequent, in deaths oft. Of the Jews, five times received I forty stripes, save one. 
Thrice was I beaten with rods, once was I stoned, thrice I suffered shipwreck, a night and a day I have been in the deep. And he continues on after this. Uh, He was in troubles, he was in poverty, he was in fear of his own life, and yet he was the one that wrote, as we read earlier, having food and raiment, let us be there with content. Uh, He was content and he charged others to be content with what God had given them. In Philippians 4 and verse 11, we read the same apostle say, Not that I speak in respect of want, for I have learned in whatsoever state I am therewith to be content. I know both how to be abased and I know how to abound. Everywhere and in all things I am instructed both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. I can do all things through Christ, which uh, strengtheneth me. So in any state that he's in, uh, even while he is receiving stripes, he's being beaten by the Jews 39 times, uh, even when he is uh, in affliction and disease, even as... You know, we see in Acts, and he mentioned earlier, even though he's adrift at sea, uh, he says that I am content in whatsoever state through Jesus Christ. Uh, He says, of of course, I can do all things through Christ, which strengtheneth me. Uh, And that passage is is sometimes uh, taken to mean that whatever we desire to do, uh, whatever we, we want to do, Uh, that we can do all those things through Christ. But rather he's saying that in whatever affliction, in whatever uh, struggles I'm in, I can be content because of Jesus Christ and through Jesus Christ. Uh, and, And I can do his will, of course, in all of that. And so Paul, another great example of contentment in the Lord. Let's look at one more in Luke 9 and verse 57. Luke 9, 57. Of course, when we're giving examples of virtue, uh, it's uh, always, we should always expect to turn to the life of Christ. In Luke 9, 57, the scripture says that it came to pass that as they went in that in the way, a certain man said unto him, Lord, I will follow thee whithersoever thou goest. And Jesus said unto him, Foxes have holes, and birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man hath not where to lay his head. Jesus in his ministry, speaking of his own poverty, he says the Son of Man, Christ himself, does not even have a place to sleep. He, he doesn't even have his own home that he can go back to and lay and sleep in. Uh, he, traveling around and doing the will of his Father in heaven, uh, did not have the same level of comfort even as the foxes out in the woods or the birds which have to sleep at the top of a tree. In Matthew 16 and verse 5, we read again of Christ's condition. Matthew 16, verse 5. When his disciples were come to the other side, they had forgotten to take bread. Then Jesus said unto them, Take heed and beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and of the Sadducees. And they reasoned among themselves, saying, It is because we have taken no bread. Which when Jesus perceived, he said unto them, O ye of little faith, why reason ye among yourselves because ye have brought no bread? Do ye not yet understand, neither remember the five loaves of the five thousand, or how many baskets ye took up, neither the seven loaves of the four thousand, and how many baskets ye took up. How is it that ye do not understand that I spake it not to you concerning bread, that ye should beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and of the Sadducees? In this little uh, account of uh, an interaction between Jesus and his disciples, 
we see that the disciples had forgotten to bring bread. That day they, they didn't have anything to eat that, that they had brought with them. Uh, you know, whether this is because of their uh, own poverty, because of, of Judas who was among them, who stole from the bag because he was the keeper of it, uh, or in, in whatever uh, other way they had just neglected to bring bread, Jesus wasn't bothered by this. Jesus wasn't even uh, speaking to that when he, when he spoke about bread to them. Uh, he was speaking of their spiritual state, their spiritual life. He knew and he taught to them that God would provide for him and that they therefore could be content with what they had. Uh, whether they had forgotten bread or whether they had brought it, Either way, uh, the Lord was content in this. And Jesus even was content until his own death. Uh, look in Isaiah 53 and verse 7. He was even contented to die for us. Isaiah 53, verse 7. The scripture says he was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He is brought as a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before her shearers is dumb, so he openeth not his mouth. He was taken from prison and from judgment, and who shall declare his generation? For he was cut off from the land of the living. For the transgression of my people was he stricken. Even when he was afflicted, oppressed, he was going to his death, yet as a lamb before her shearers is dumb, he did not even open his mouth in protest. He was contented even as he went on the cross and died for our transgressions. Jesus, the ultimate example of contentment in the Lord. And so uh, just to, to start off this study, I wanted to look at these, these examples of contentment to, to give us, if not a uh, uh, you know, a, a worded out definition of what contentment is, we can nonetheless see what it is in the lives of Christ and his disciples. And so I'd like to go on and start to study the technical side of contentment in the scripture. And I'd like us to start by looking at how discontentment is a sin, how discontentment is sin. Look in First Timothy 6. Uh, verse 6 again with me. 1 Timothy 6, verse 6. As we read before, godliness with contentment is great gain. For we brought nothing into this world, and it is certain we can carry nothing out. And having food and raiment, let us be there with content. But they that will be rich fall into temptation and a snare and into many foolish and hurtful lusts which drowned men in destruction and perdition. For the love of money is the root of all evil, which while some coveted after, they have erred uh, from the faith and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. In uh, opposition to contentment here, he says, they that will be rich, they who would have more than what God would give to them, they fall into temptation, into a snare, into perdition, into foolish and hurtful lusts. Uh, they have fallen into the root of all evil, it says, and they have erred from the faith. Uh, to be discontent in the Lord is a grave sin, and it leads to, to, to many other sins. Just as we have already seen that contentment is a chief virtue, one of the great virtues in the Lord. Discontentment is one of the chief sins. Uh, it, it, discontentment with what God would give to us. Discontentment is often, uh, well, it is closely linked with un unthankfulness in the scripture in Romans 121 because that when they knew God they glorified him not as God neither were thankful but became vain in their imaginations and their foolish heart was 
darkened. To be discontented is to be ungrateful with what God has given to us. To think that it's not enough for us. To think that we need more. That that God has not given us sufficiently as he promised. And that that is in some way to... to, uh, impugn God's goodness, to to say that it's not as good as it claims to be. Uh, God has even been good to the unthankful, though, uh, to the discontented. In Luke 6 and verse 35, uh, to neglect to be grateful, to neglect to be content in the Lord, uh, is uh, to to not recognize the goodness of God towards you uh, and towards me. In Luke six thirty five, Christ says, "But love ye your enemies, and do good and lend, hoping for nothing again. And your reward shall be great, and ye shall be the children of the highest. For he is kind unto the unthankful and to." the evil. Uh, Those that are ungrateful to the Lord, those who are discontent with what the Lord has given to them, God has even been kind to them, even if they do not recognize it, even if we do not recognize it and we are unthankful to him. He has still been good and kind towards us. Uh, It's it's a grave sin because it, it overlooks God's goodness. We remember uh, quite a little while ago when we looked through the doctrine of what sin is. And we saw that sin is a failure to give glory to God. Ungratefulness, discontentedness is to fail to glorify God for his goodness towards us. Uh, Christ says he has been kind to us. He has been good to us. He has caused his sun to shine on us. He has sent his rain on us. Everything good that we have comes from him. And even if we're unthankful, that's true. And if we neglect to give him glory and thanks for it, then it is a great sin. The fruit of discontentedness is envy also. Discontentedness is not just a sin in itself, but it leads to many other sins. Turn to Psalm 73 and verse 1 with me. Psalm 73. The scripture says, Truly God is good to Israel, even to such as are of a clean heart. But as for me, my feet were almost gone. My steps had well nigh slipped. For I was envious at the foolish when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. He says that his foot had uh, almost slipped. He had almost uh, fallen out of God's good favor because when he saw the wicked prosper, He was envious of them. He was discontented with his own situation and he desired their situation. And so he had sinned. In Exodus 20, 17, Thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's house. Thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's wife, nor his manservant, nor his maidservant, nor his ox, nor his donkey, nor anything that is thy neighbor's. Uh, To covet to be envious of someone else's condition is not to be content in our own. This was the exact sin that was often lifted up against Christ in his ministry. In Mark 15, 9, Pilate answered them saying, Will ye that I release unto you the king of the Jews? For he knew that the chief priests had delivered him for envy through discontentment. Uh, through envy of Christ and his goodness and his ministry, they delivered him up to Pilate to kill him and also of his disciples. In Acts 13, 44, the next Sabbath day came almost the whole city together to hear the word of God. But when the Jews saw the multitude, they were filled with envy and spake against those things which were spoken by Paul, contradicting and blaspheming. Uh, Envy 
what the Jews uh, again had is, is they saw that almost the entire city had come out to hear the uh, the words of the apostles, and so they were discontent. They were filled with envy against them, and they spake out against them. Uh, this is the fruit of discontentment: is envy. Um, if if I'm not happy with my own situation, with what God has given to me, then I'm looking for what God has given to someone else. I, I'm I'm trying to 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 get to myself what He's given to them, uh, and not being content in my own place. A fruit of envy and discontentment also is fretting uh, against uh, our circumstance, uh, being. Uh, uh, disquieted about what God has given to us and being afraid for ourselves. In Proverbs 24 and verse 19, the scripture says, Fret not thyself because of evil men, neither be thou envious at the wicked, for there shall be no reward of the evil man. The candle of the wicked shall be put out. He says, uh, fret not thyself because of evil men, and he equates that to neither be thou envious at the wicked. If we are envious, we begin to fret over, uh, over other people's uh, things in our own situation. Uh, we begin to, to, to want what they have and fear because we do not have it. We, we see our situation. We think that we need what they have. We, we think that we can't get by unless we have what they have. And so we, uh, we begin to fret. We, we're afraid for uh, ourselves. It's, it's a form of self-pity uh, in ourselves. Isaiah 8 and verse 20 says this, to the law and to the testimony. If they speak not according to this word, it is because there is no light in them. And they shall pass through it hardly beset and hungry. And it shall come to pass that when they shall be hungry, they shall fret themselves and curse their king and their God and look upward. And they shall look unto the earth and behold trouble and darkness, dimness of anguish, and they shall be driven to darkness. Uh, when they begin to be hungry, it says, and this is not a, a, a just a, a contentment uh, or a, a contented um, hunger of the flesh, the, the, the flesh needing what it needs to survive, but a discontented fretting hunger, uh, a desiring to have and not having. Uh, they will begin to fret themselves and they will curse their king and their God. Because of this troubles and darkness, evil comes onto them. Uh, so a fruit of discontentment is fretting and ultimately blasphemy, we see. Uh, beginning to curse God because he did not give to us what we wanted. And uh, a final form of this uh, sin is, of course, violence and uh, sins against our fellow man. A turn to Proverbs 24 and verse 1. Proverbs 24 and verse 1. Be not thou envious against evil men, neither desire to be with them, for their heart studieth destruction, and their lips talk of mischief. For the envious man, they are always seeking to destroy. Their heart goes after it. They, they desire what other men have, and they are willing to destroy them in order to get it. Their lips always talk of mischief. You'll notice that when someone is obviously eaten up with envy, they are obviously discontented with their lives, they will speak evil of other men, they will speak about how they wish that that person, uh, something wrong would happen to them, and that they would receive what they have. Uh, turn to James 4 and verse 1. James 4 and verse 1.
From whence come wars and fightings among you? Come they not hence, even of your lusts that war in your members? Ye lust and have not. Ye kill and desire to have and cannot obtain. Ye fight and war, yet ye have not, because ye ask not. Ye ask and receive not, because ye ask amiss, that ye may consume it upon your lusts. Ye adulterers and adulteresses, know ye not that the friendship of the world is enmity with God? Whosoever therefore will be a friend of the world is the enemy of God. Do ye think that the scripture saith in vain, the spirit that dwelleth in us lusteth to envy? Uh, he s speaks about how the, the uh, congregation here, uh, because of their lusts, because of their envious spirit, because of their desiring to have and they do not have, that this is where wars and fightings come uh, come from, how they uh, uh, hate each other because they do not have. Uh, even when they ask of the Lord for something, it is only out of envy. It is not out of a contented asking him for the things that we need. Uh, the, this spirit of envy, of, of discontentment, uh, has led to violence among them. Uh, it's led to wars and fightings. Uh, the the sin we see of, of discontentment in the Lord uh, leads to, to so much of the, the troubles that we have uh, in our world. Um, it's where wars come from. Of course, we know that that's the case. But when one nation has something that another nation wants, therefore they go to war. Uh, it's where all uh, interpersonal, uh, much of interpersonal trouble comes from uh, because one person has, another person has not, and he is discontented and he goes after what the other has. Uh, all of this just shows us uh, that the love of money, discontentment with what we have, is the root of evil. And so, uh, with that, uh, since uh, it's getting uh, pretty late uh, tonight, uh, we'll just look at one more scripture together. Look at Jonah chapter 4 with me. Jonah chapter 4. We saw earlier three examples of contentedness, and now I'd like us to look at one example of discontentedness and see how it all played out in Jonah. Jonah chapter 4. I'll just read the uh, former two verses. God saw their works, that they turned from their evil way, and God repented of the evil that he had said that he would do unto them, and he did it not against Nineveh, uh, that he would have destroyed them, but because they repented, he turned away from the calamity that he was bringing onto them. And in chapter 4, verse 1, But it displeased Jonah exceedingly, and he was very angry. And he prayed unto the Lord and said, I pray thee, O Lord, was not this my saying when I was yet in my country? Therefore I fled because uh, unto, before unto Tarshish. For I knew that thou art a gracious God and merciful, slow to anger and of great kindness, and repentest thee of the evil. Therefore now, O Lord, I beseech thee, uh, take away, I beseech thee, my life, for it is better for me to die than to live. Then said the Lord, Dost thou well to be angry? So when he saw God's mercy towards uh, Nineveh, uh, when he saw his, his loving kindness towards them, that his, uh, his wrath was going to be stayed against them, though what he wanted was for God to destroy them, uh, he says that he was angry even unto death. Uh, he began to pity himself. Uh, and he sought, again, for their destruction. Uh, he sought for them to, to, to be killed. Um, he, as a, a prophet of the Lord, knew that God's judgment came by Nineveh. It came by Assyria against Israel. He hated the prosperity that God had given to Assyria and so he, uh, so he wanted them destroyed, just as all the Jews at that time wanted Assyria destroyed because of their envy, because of uh, they didn't uh, want the Lord to bring uh, his judgment through Nineveh. And so Jonah 
wanted God's judgment on Nineveh instead. And when Nineveh repented, uh, he did not like it. And so he began to be angry. We see that he began to be uh, to pity himself, and he sought violence against uh, Nineveh. In verse 5, So Jonah went out of the city and sat on the east side of the city, and there made him a booth and sat under it in the shadow till he might see what would become of the city. And the Lord God prepared a gourd and made it to come up over Jonah that it might be a shadow over his head to deliver him from his grief. So Jonah was exceeding glad of the gourd and God prepared a worm that when the morning rose the next day and it smote the gourd that it withered. And it came to pass when the sun did rise that God prepared a vehement east wind and the sun beat upon the head of Jonah that he fainted and wished in himself to die and said, it is better for me to die than to live. Uh, he saw the mercy of God being showed to Nineveh. He knew that God would not destroy Nineveh. And even so, he went up and sought for their destruction. He, he, he looked for God's judgment on them. And all the while, as we saw earlier, God was kind to him. He was kind to the unthankful man. And he caused the gourd to grow up. He caused the worm to destroy it. He caused the east wind to come and blow on him. And all of this for Jonah's good, uh, to, to teach Jonah uh, uh, a lesson, to, t uh, to teach him mercy and compassion. And so God said to Jonah, Dost thou well to be angry for the gourd? And he said, I do well to be angry, even unto death. Then said the Lord, Thou hast had pity on the gourd, for the which thou hast not labored, neither madest it grow, which came up in a night, and perished in a night. And should not I spare Nineveh, that great city, wherein are more than six score thousand persons that cannot discern between their right hand and their left, and also much cattle? Uh, as we see all to teach Jonah this lesson of compassion, but because of his envy, because of his discontentment with how God had acted towards the city that he hated. Uh, he sought violence against them. Uh, he fretted in himself of what God would do uh, and fretted his own life and he took self-pity. Uh, in all of this, Jonah was sinful. Uh, and we should uh, in ourselves uh, uh, try not to be as Jonah was. Uh, to try and be content with what God has done towards us. And so with that, uh, since it's uh, late, uh, we'll go ahead and we'll sing and pray and uh, pray and sing and be dismissed. Uh, our Father, we come before you, and Lord, we thank you for your word. Lord, we thank you that in Christ we can uh, have contentment, and we pray that you would help us to have that this week. Lord, help us to be thankful, bring to our remembrance all that you've done for us, and Lord, we pray that uh, you would be with those that aren't with us uh, tonight also, Lord, uh, to help them to have contentment. And Lord, to know joy in you, uh, that you're with them and that you're kind towards them, uh, even in their difficulties. Lord, we pray that uh, you'd go with us and protect us and that you'd bring us back into this place to worship together again. And it's in Christ's name we pray it all. Amen.